about, of course, and, <laughs> and the war on terrorism. And uh, what underlies what we call the war on terrorism, the series of challenges which the nation faces is an extraordinarily interesting dynamics viewed differently by many people. But in any case, those facets remain of interest to all of us. They're not always clear. Um, what you do about them, which falls under the rubric of the war on terrorism, uh, is also debatable. Um, but it's a central question for us now, and certainly will continue to be with the new administration and into the future. Um, the next president uh, will be confronted with a set of difficulties. And of course, uh, the way in which the next president will address that war on terrorism is subject to some debate today. Uh, we're delighted that we have someone who is thoughtful and deeply experienced in these areas. And uh, we're grateful for him sharing his time with us this evening. David Wood um, was a correspondent early in his career with Time Magazine, uh, heading their bureau in Nairobi, dealing with uh, guerrilla warfare, uh, conflict, and uh, civil unrest throughout the African continent. He was the diplomatic correspondent for the Washington Star until its demise. He served as defense correspondent for the Los Angeles Times. And then from 1984 until 2006, uh, worked for the, uh, uh, a major newspaper chain, Newhouse, I believe, and then joined The Sun as its defense correspondent in uh, 2006, and has been there since. Um, he's dealt with questions of conflict uh, throughout the world. Uh, he's been in Latin America, covered the Sandinistas there, covered our interventions in, in Panama and Haiti. He's been uh, in Africa, not only in the, with the Nairobi uh, uh, business, but, but also uh, in Somalia, where he was embedded with an American unit for a while, out of which his experience three months of combat uh, resulted in a book of his. He's also uh, uh, experienced in, in Europe, uh, not only during the Cold War, where he amusingly, I guess, was uh, both with American troops on one side of the uh, intra-German border and also uh, patrolled the border with, with Russian forces. He's reported from China, covered the Marcos uh, 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 exit from office in, in the Philippines. Uh, in, in Europe, he's dealt with Bosnia. He was there before the American intervention and covered the American intervention. So he's, he's been on uh, uh, the major continents and in the Middle East, he's covered the Gulf War, episodes after that, twice has been embedded in Afghanistan, four times in Iraq, and he'll be going back to Afghanistan uh, soon, I understand. Uh, he's familiar with the American military and its equipment. As his resume says, he's taken off from aircraft carriers, he's been on B-52 raids, he's uh, uh, been aboard most of the Navy vessels, battleships, and uh, both attack and uh, uh, strategic missile submarines. He uh, went through uh, Army Ranger training, which that should be sufficient as an introduction alone. <laughs> but it also probably tells us something about him. And uh, it was quite a spectacular thing to go through that training, I think, especially when you're, uh, you're not part of the military. But having uh, become familiar with most of the equipment and having served with the military personnel, and reflected very seriously on, on, on the questions of, of uh, conflict res resolution, peacekeeping, and what you do about a post-war effort uh, to create civil societies. Uh, he's extraordinarily well equipped to address the topic for this evening. Uh, we have, uh, I think, much to learn on this. It's my great pleasure to present Mr. David Wood. <clears throat> Uh, well, thanks for having me here tonight. I, I am so looking forward to this. Uh, this is going to be great fun, and uh, it's an honor to be in front of you folks. This is quite a, quite a, a distinguished audience. Frank left out uh, one thing uh, from that introduction, which, which I particularly wanted to mention. 
<clears throat> I grew up as a Quaker and was raised as a pacifist. And, uh, <laughs> but what I wanted to mention was that um, some years ago, I went out to the California desert to cover a Marine Corps uh, war game. And the day uh, that I got there, they were having a, a tank live fire exercise when they take a bunch of tanks and they race through the desert firing uh, those big guns. And when I got out there, the Marine commander said, oh, I'm so glad you're here. I need a loader. <laughs> and I said, well, you're SOL. I'm not a loader. I'm a reporter. And he goes, no, you're a loader. <laughs> Marines can be pretty persuasive. So I climbed down up onto this huge 80-ton, uh, I guess, tank and squeezed down into the loader's place, which is about the size of this platform, uh, this dais here. And um, the, loader's, the loader is the lowliest person in the tank. And his job is you, you, you press a lever with your knee and, a, and a, a gate slides open and there's a rack of shells and you pull one out. These are 120 millimeter shells. They're about my size and weight. And you, you wrench that thing around and you heave it up into the breech of the gun and you ram the lever closed and you shout up. And then the guys up in the turret who have all the fun because they can see out decide when they're going to fire this thing and they press the button at, at a time when they don't tell you when that's going to be. And there's this enormous gout of flame and smoke and incredible noise. And and I remember just in the nick of time, he said, don't let your legs stick out because the breech of the gun rams back into this little space. And if your knee is there, it'll just be gone. So off we went, uh, you know, this Quaker kid out there uh, loading the gun and having it fired. And, and I was just shrieking with terror and, and some exhilaration, exhilaration, I have to admit which is sort of the way I attack all of my stories these days. But um, this is one of the things that my dear, um, gentle Quaker mother doesn't boast about. Um, one of the things that I've done that she doesn't ever mention to her friends. <clears throat> I bring this up because um, I wanted to sort of set the context for this talk tonight. Um, I am a reporter, and even though I travel with the military and eat with them and sleep beside them and ride into combat with them, uh, I am not one of them. And, and the thing that distinguishes me from them, well, two things, really. I'm not licensed to kill. They are. Um, but also, I'm, I travel with a heavy sense of skepticism. I don't believe most of what I'm told, and, and I try very hard to dig out the essential truth, and, and in fact, I'm 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 often cause my colleagues some embarrassment at a high-level briefing at the Pentagon or the White House when I raise my hand and say, "Well, how do you know that?" <laughs> Which is, is not something you usually ask a senior official. Um, but I mentioned it also the whole thing about Quakerism because I did grow up as a pacifist and I retain a lot of those those beliefs, and it gives me you know I. I go to a place like Afghanistan and cover U.S. military option, operations with a, with a question in the back of my mind, you know, isn't there a better way to do this? And it's interesting because I find a lot of resonance with my friends in the military, and these are pretty hard folks. Um, you know, you spend a lot of time with them, you have some deep conversations, and. Um, you know, what I've found increasingly is they are asking the same kind of question these days. <clears throat> um, so anyway, that's sort of my theme for tonight, and we'll get back to that. I want also to talk a little bit about how do I know all this stuff, and how come I'm standing up here and you're not, <laughs> so, which I think is a fair question. Uh, I talk a lot to very senior people in the Pentagon most of them are wear uniforms. Some of them are policymakers. Uh, because I'm a reporter, I get access to them, which is pretty cool. Because um, you know these are some pretty special, high-ranking folks, and I find them mostly to be really smart, really um, creative. They work really hard, and um, and they're they have staggering responsibilities which is always a little bit humbling for me because I don't have any responsibilities. 
The other group of people that I spend a lot of time talking to are the, <clears throat> what I think of as the blue collar military. And these are the guys who have their fingers on the trigger, uh, their hands on the helicopter controls. By the way, a lot of them are women. Uh, I just spent some time with a helicopter squadron, a marine helicopter squadron. I, it seemed to me like half of the pilots and crew, these are combat folks, were women. Really interesting. So these are the blue collar folks, and they don't get to make policy. But here's the interesting thing. Out there, when you get out to, to um, you know, little villages in Afghanistan or the back streets of, of Baghdad, these are the folks that make it happen. And so if there's, a, if there's a village where there's an agreement between the sheikhs and U.S. forces, or if there's an airstrike that happens that doesn't kill children, you know, it's usually a sergeant in there who's made that happen, or, or a young lieutenant. Uh, I, these folks are, I, I just can't say enough good things about them. There's one third group of people who I talk to who are the think tank people, and again, extraordinarily gifted and hardworking folks. And you, you, if you're a reporter, you got to learn to know and cultivate these people because this year's Johns Hopkins uh, associate analyst is uh, next year's assistant uh, defense secretary. So, you know, there tends to be a fairly um, a rapid movement in and out of think tanks and government, so that's good. Okay, so what is it that I'm talking to all these folks about? Three things, and I want to I want to sort of go through them quickly. Um, one is, you know, they look at all these bad things that are happening out in the world, <clears throat> and there's sort of a collective sense of uh oh. In fact. You know, as I was thinking about this, and I've spent a lot of time over the last six weeks talking to people about the threats, you know, or as the Pentagon likes to call them, the challenges. And, um, you know, here we are today. We have about 200,000 troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. There's hard fighting going on. Casualties are running about 35, 40 a month. Um, you know, there are storm clouds sort of over Iran, North Korea, um, Gaza, a Iraq and Afghanistan for sure, a couple of other places, Kenya. Um, you know, we may look back on this year as sort of the, the last year of tranquility. <laughs> so, second thing we talk about is the cost of keeping pace with all these problems. And, he, he, I mean, you know the whole thing about the um, the military's equipment wearing out and it's got to be replaced and all that. Um, and that's a big cost. And the ever-growing um, defense budget, the rising cost of weapons, which is staggering. Um, and associated problems like the U.S. debt, which is owned largely by foreigners and that causes its own set of problems. I want to mention another cost here that, that we need to reckon with, but we don't know that we don't know what the cost is, and that is, how do you measure the effect on the kids that we send into battle? And there's been a lot written about this. There's been a lot of newspaper stories and TV uh, specials on, you know, the effects of battle on kids. I tell you what, we don't know. We really don't know what the effect is, and I, I'll come back to all of these things in a minute. Third is my little ray of sunshine here, because <laughs> I thought we probably needed it. And that is, you know, Frank said I've been a journalist for almost 40 years. That's true. But I've been covering the military since 1977, so I figure 30 years. But in all that time, and I've been all over the world, and I've met all kinds of interesting and uninteresting people, and, and I've known a lot of folks. And in all that time, I have never, ever come across a group of people who are in this national security community today, and I'm talking about the think tank people, the blue collar folks, the generals, the policymakers, everybody, who are as smart and dedicated and creative and thoughtful and interesting as the crew we have here now. So I guess part of my message tonight is, yeah, we got problems, but we got good folks on our side. Okay, so uh, 
I think I have a tendency, maybe we all do, to over-intellectualize problems and, and describe them in big, grandiose terms. And when I was, when I was thinking about what I wanted to say tonight, <coughs> um, a character sprang to mind who I met, again, in the California desert, a different part of the desert. This was an army exercise, um, and uh, it was winter. And I met this, who was a grizzled old um, master sergeant in the back of an M113 personnel carrier. And I said, must have been a heater, because I kind of remember trying to hold my hands over something warm. And he was, he had a big map mounted on a, an easel. And he was trying to copy onto this map, um, you know, uh, phase, phase lines and all kinds of stuff from a piece of paper he had for an operation that was upcoming. And his pen, he had a grease pencil and it kept breaking. And he was getting more and more angry. Meanwhile, I'm the fresh young Pentagon reporter, and I was telling him all the wonderful things that he's going to get from technology that I'd heard at the Pentagon. And, you know, gizmos that would remove the fog of war, gizmos that would give him total knowledge of everything his enemy was doing. And he finally turned around and he spat a big stream of tobacco juice on the floor, and he said, son, I will kiss the behind of the first guy who can get me what I really need, which is a grease pencil that won't shatter when it freezes. <laughs> so let's come down to earth a little bit. Let me run through the challenges or the threats really quickly, because I think we all know what they are. And anything, any of these things that I mentioned, we can go back and talk about in depth if you're interested. The Marines have a phrase for a part of the world that they call, I think they call it the arc of instability. It used to be called the, the crescent of crisis, I think. But anyway, it's the, it's the, you know, the bad news belt that runs from roughly Bolivia, skips across the Atlantic, through Africa, into the Middle East, into the stands, and out into East Asia. And in this part of the world, there's a couple of of ominous things going on. One is the youth bulge. There is a huge increase in, like, I, I forget what the exact uh, demographics are, but it's like 15 to 20 year olds. Huge increase. And that is driving um, a decreasing ability of governments to provide the basics for their folks. Uh, food, clean, food, clean water, jobs, education, and, and a sense of um, safety. I think partly for that reason, we're seeing governments, um, and we're seeing people who increasingly are not identifying with the government, but they're identifying instead with a sectarian or ethnic group. And you see that everywhere, for all across this region. Um, and, and in Kenya, you know, where I lived for many years and where we thought this couldn't ever possibly happen, uh, you know, we found to our shock and horror that, yep, the same thing is happening there. Governments can't provide. People start identifying with splinter groups, you know, with their ethnic, in this case, tribes. And uh, violence is, uh, is the result. Um, Scarce resources, the Marines, you know, I've been talking to the Marines a lot. They're, they're deep thinkers, and everyone I talked to mentioned conflict over water as a key driver of conflict. I thought that was interesting. Also, money. There's a huge amount of money that's washing around the world. Uh, petrodollars, money's flowing into the European Union, and, and China, which hold a great deal of our debt, which is not a good thing for us. And we could talk about that later if you want. Um, in some places, and I thought of coastal Nigeria in this case, you have a really awful mix of a failed state, a lot of money, corruption, uh, drugs, organized crime, piracy, human uh, slavery, and oil, which we need. And this is a really interesting problem, which I think the Navy has finally woken up to and has started sending some ships into the Gulf of Guinea, which is in what we used to inelegantly call the armpit of Africa. 
you know, where, right where it sort of bends there. There's a lot of oil in that region. And I think it's going to be in 10 or 15 years, the new Persian Gulf, where we will have lots of military forces. There'll be lots of money, lots of instability, and we'll probably be sending lots of Americans into that part of the world. OK. Um, another thing that's happening is that all across this region and up and down the the scale of conflict, from little tribal conflicts up to big ones, um, an increased willingness to accept violence as an outlet for the frustrations that all these problems cause. Boy, you see this in Kenya. You know, wow. Um, last year's atrocities seem to become this year's commonplace. You know, how often are you going to read a story about another suicide bomber in a in a in a marketplace in Iraq. I mean, we just get inured to this. And, uh, you know, when I started thinking about it and what conflict was like 10 years ago, it's really changed. It's gotten much, much nastier and, and we've gotten used to it. I don't know where that's going. Let me throw in something that doesn't seem to belong in this category, but think about was it 18 months ago or a year ago that China shot down a satellite? Uh oh. You know, all of a sudden it's the same kind of thing. A big, taboo had been broken, because there was always this unspoken agreement among the space powers. We need our satellites to see and communicate. You don't want to shoot down anybody else's satellites, so we haven't. They did. Uh-oh. It's the same, it's, I think it's the same phenomenon of, of accepting violence as an outlet for frustration where you didn't used to feel right about doing that. Sounds almost funny when I say it, but uh, if there's anywhere that this is not happening or where the reverse is happening, I'd be happy to know about it. I had on this list um, of problems the collapse of the U.S. strategy of trying to ensure peace by pushing democracy into other countries. But I kind of think that belongs in the plus column, not the minus column. So. We'll dispense with that. Let's talk about weapons of mass destruction, um, <laughs> another happy topic. And I'm talking about the, not the Iraqi WMDs, but the real ones, the ones that really exist. Okay, Pakistan, clearly a problem. Um, I've talked to some of the Pakistani officers who serve on the board that looks after these weapons, and uh, I, th I think we got a problem there. Uh, North Korea is still a problem, obviously. Um, notice that our Navy fleets and our air bases in the Middle East, or anywhere, and places where, uh, ports, for example, where we unload troops and equipment, none of those have any protection against nuclear blast and its effects. Uh-oh, yeah. Um, there's a whole group of people in the Pentagon who are starting to worry about this big time. A bigger problem than the nuclear weapons we know about, obviously, is the ones we don't know about. And I had a real interesting conversation with a guy in the Pentagon last week, and that was, you know, we were talking about counterproliferation and how you find the folks who are uh, trying to acquire or build nuclear weapons. And he said, you know, we're looking at the wrong thing. We're looking for a process like we have, you know, the big Eisenhower area industrial process of acquiring nuclear weapons where you, you have a supply chain and you have research labs and you have you know production facilities and safety things and there's this big cumbersome easy to find process and structure you know what we're finding the bad guys are doing is they're skipping all that you know they can put together we think um, or they think a nuclear device using the material that's freely available almost everywhere, um, using known techniques, and make a really inelegant but scary kind of nuclear device. This guy told me, this guy is an officer who serves on the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He said, you know, we think that it's, you know, a question of when, not if, somebody reaches who's trying to put together a nuclear weapon uh, reaches critical mass, so to speak. Um, 
But he said, you know, another interesting thing he said was, I'm more worried about biological weapons. I said, why is that? And he said, because you don't know you've been attacked until it's way too late. Which brings up a, a deeper problem here, and that is that today's adversaries of ours think and act quicker than we do. And, you know, I think you only have to look at the question of the IEDs in Iraq, the, um, the roadside bombs. Um, anybody in Iraq can go to Radio Shack, buy a few dollars worth of parts, and put together a device which um, last year caused the United States to embark on a five-year, $13 billion program to buy armored trucks to protect our troops. Well, guess what? Um, you know, so we're one year into that program, and we're flying these things to Iraq. And I don't even want to think about how much that costs. So we're one year into this four-year program, and already the bad guys have gone back to Radio Shack and bought a different set of parts and built devices that can now kill guys who are inside these heavy armored trucks. Um, hmm. And we still have four years and $13 billion to pay for that program. It's not only that they can act faster and um, think faster than we can, they're also really good at hiding. And I had an interesting conversation this morning with a Pentagon official who runs the special operations and what they call low intensity conflict um, directorate in, in, the, in the Pentagon. And he said the biggest problem we have now is not killing people or destroying stuff, it's finding you know, who is responsible? There's no, there's no return address on these IED attacks. There's no, you know, and this is a huge problem because the entire defense budget is aimed at buying stuff that can kill people. That's the easy part. We can't find them. And one of the things this means is that if somebody does acquire a nuclear device, chances are, and it goes off, chances are we won't know who it was. So how do you deter that problem? And a person doesn't even have to set off the device, just has to be able to boast credibly, I got the bomb, you know, come get me. So this is a, this is a huge problem that, um, that the Pentagon is working on very hard. Okay. Um, I, I think we can go into the cost problem now. <laughs> um, the defense budget just came out. It's $515 billion, except it's not because that doesn't count $70 billion that is for the war, and that's just a down payment for this year. The, the costs we're talking about here are, they have a really high giggle factor. It's like you can't be serious. The, there's a new airplane called the F-35, which is sort of a vertical takeoff airplane. It's kind of a neat piece of gear, and the Marines can't wait to get a hold of this thing. We're going to buy $300 billion worth of these airplanes. That You know, like when Donald Rumsfeld came to the Pentagon, that was the size of the entire defense budget. Now that's just for the F-35. And I wrote down some other things here. Um, Submarines, $90 billion worth of submarines, $65 billion of F-22s. I was just picking off the low-hanging fruit here and playing with my calculator, which is so much fun when you're looking at the defense budget. Now, these are program costs, and they're over a number of years, so I'm cheating a little bit. But, but um, I did look up the cost of just the F-22 for this year, $4.4 billion <coughs> which means for each F-22, we're paying $220 million. Okay, I, I mean, I, I think that's really astonishing. Again, given the fact that the problem, that that piece of hardware is a very sophisticated way to kill people. And the problem we're having is not killing people. We got that. It's finding the people. Okay, I often hear people say when the defense budget comes up, I hear this all the time, the United States spends more than every other country in the world combined on defense. 
or the, you know, the counter to that is during World War II, the United States spent 29% of GNP on defense. You know, okay, I think both of those things are co totally meaningless because, so what if we spend as much as everybody else? You know, the, the United Nations doesn't ask Sri Lanka to fly peacekeepers around the world and keep them supplied, which we do. And, you know, the whole thing about percent of GNP, and this is going to be a big issue, I think, in the campaign because this issue of, you know, are we at 4% of GNP defense spending? At 4%, we should be at 4%. There's a lot of argument about, you know, what precise percent of GNP is correct. Well, you know what nobody's asking is, what are we buying this stuff for? What do we need it for? And, you know, it's interesting because if you, if you back out of the defense budget debate and you ask, what is it that we want to do in the world? And, and how, how, what do we need to do that? And, and what do we need to buy to get to make that happen? That's a completely different set of questions, which very few people are asking, except in the Pentagon. They are asking those questions. One of the things they look at at the Pentagon is the State Department budget. The entire State Department budget, and that includes building embassies, paying <laughs> diplomats, hiring uh, Blackwater security guards, um, all the export-import bank loans, membership in the IMF, all this a huge amount of stuff, um, that adds up to $15.2 billion. Development aid, that's the stuff that's supposed to win us friends, one point, one, <coughs> excuse me, $1.6 billion. Okay, remember the defense budget, 515? This is 1.6, and that 1.6 billion, that's what we spend on development aid, that will pay for seven F-22 jet fighters. So, okay, the deeper cost that I wanted to mention, um, and I'll, I'll hurry up here. The deeper cost that I think we're incurring that we're not looking at, um, the effect on the kids we send into battle. Let me just tell two quick stories. I came across a guy in a VA hospital uh, not long ago I think he was like in his mid-80s. <clears throat> As a youth, 18 or 19-year-old, landed at Normandy on D-Day, crossed the beach, got up okay. Um, the next day, he was sent back down to the beach on a body detail, picking up body parts of the company he came ashore with that hadn't made it. Um, that was okay. Fought across France into Germany, won the war, came home, got married, had kids, became a fireman, rose to be fire chief, had grandkids, and I think great-grandkids, retired, very well-adjusted, successful guy. Apparently, one night woke up screaming, and it was the body parts. And, and they took him to the hospital, and he's still there, being well cared for. But again, it just drives my belief that we don't know, you know, what happens to these folks. The other group that I wanted to tell you, tell you about just briefly was <clears throat> um, a group of soldiers I sat around with for an afternoon uh, in, um, I guess it was November, up at Fort Drum, New York, the 10th Mountain Division. Five or six guys um, in their late 20s, early 30s, they both, they'd all had two combat tours in Iraq, and they'd just come back from a third combat tour in Afghanistan, and they were getting ready to go again. These are 15-month tours. I mean, these guys, these guys have seen a lot of combat, and they are scout snipers. And I don't know if you know what a scout sniper is. These are folks we hired to hunt human beings and kill them. I mean, it is, it is the most direct kind of combat you can imagine. I loved these guys. They were fun to be with. They were, they were you know, big and strong. They had good teeth. They were all handsome. You know, they laughed a lot. Self-confident, smart, thoughtful, humorous, good folks. And I asked them all if, about their backgrounds, and it was struck me that out of the six, one was married. The rest said, I would never get married. You know, I, I, don't, I would never put a woman through that. I don't want to start a family. You know, this, this kind of life is incompatible with that. So I went to the Army demographer and looked up some statistics, and the, the percent of soldiers who are married 
is dropping off for the first time in like three decades. Pretty interesting. You know, in my experience, when you go into combat, you experience both the best of humanity in your fellow soldiers, sort of selflessness and, you know, I don't want to call it heroism, but you know what, what happens out there is people do really spectacularly selfless things. And so you see the best of humanity there, but you also see the worst. And I think the best that you see, you confine to your group, your platoon, your squad, you know, your guys. These are the best guys, and it's, it may, cements those bonds. The worst that you see, you sort of generalize out to the rest of humanity. Um, so that what happens is a group of guys like these scout snipers become very insulated from the rest of us and sort of like monks, you know, they, they belong in this very small group and they're, and the rest of civilian society, American society and our values and, and our normalcy kind of fade away. And these guys were saying, you know, I hate this being back at Fort Drum. This sucks. I hate this. You know, I want to go back. And they're just, just uncomfortable with peacetime. So I, again, I say, you know, we don't know what it is that we ask of these people and what the cost is, but it's mounting. Okay, uh, just real quick. In this huge pot of horrible stuff that I've served up tonight, <laughs> I apologize. Um, you know, again, I'm struck by the wisdom and the, and the creativity of the people who are tackling these problems at every level, you know, from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs down to Sergeant Schmatz, you know. These are good people. They think hard about these problems. They're out there trying to solve them. And I'll just give you one quick example. I just came back from Camp Lejeune at the 24th Marine Expeditionary Unit, which is going to Afghanistan. They're the reinforcements that Bush just ordered up a couple of weeks ago. Uh, 2,200 Marines, they have an infantry battalion um, onto which they've added artillery, engineers, psychological operations folks, communicators. They have an air squadron with helicopters and jets, and they have uh, a huge logistics operation which has bulldozers and trucks and stuff. They can do anything. They can wage wars. They can build um, roads, bridges. I mean, a tremendously capable bunch of Marines. And the guy that runs this outfit <clears throat> is a colonel named Peter Patronzio. Interesting guy, very hard background, special forces, two tours in Iraq, seen the worst of it. So I went to see him in his office and he's sitting there at his desk with his head in his hands and papers and books piled up on his desk. And I said, so what are you going to do in, in Afghanistan? <clears throat> and he goes, well, I don't really know, but here's what I'm wrestling with. How can I be more lethal and less kinetic? And I was like, huh? Okay, kinetic. Kinetic means, you know, it's the, it's the energy contained in a moving object, like a fist. And in the military context, kinetic means bang, bang, you know, explosives, bullets, shells, missiles, you know, stuff that blows up. That's kinetic. Non-kinetic in the military context is road building, you know, nation building, you know, that kind of stuff. Winning hearts and minds, all that, that whole area of stuff. And here's Peter Patronzio uh, taking 2,200 Marines to Afghanistan, and he's worried about how to be less kinetic. That's his thing. And I said, well, how do you do that? And he goes, well, you know, I'm really, I'm really wrestling with this problem, but I think, for example, the Taliban have to keep recruiting. And, and if you could somehow cut off their recruiting, that would be lethal to them. I said, well, how do you cut off their recruiting? And he goes, well, you go into a village where they're recruiting young kids and you give the kids an alternative. You build a great school or you, you give them scholarships. I don't know, there's lots of stuff you could do. You just cut off their recruiting base. <laughs> so, after a couple hours, I walked out of his office. We'd had a good conversation. I looked back. It was late at night, light burning, building empty. You know, all the Marines gone home except for the colonel. He's there, you know, and he's reading his books, and he's got all these papers piled up. He's working this problem. 
And I came away thinking, we're in good hands. We're in good hands. Okay, that's, um, I, I want to leave it there, and I'd really like to hear your questions. Please have at me on anything you can think of. Yes. The question was, uh, which is going to give way first, the uh, tax cuts or, um, or the American Imperium, which insists on going around the world and making peace on our own terms? Does that capture it pretty well? Yes. Right. Okay. Um, the momentum of the defense budget is not to be stopped. So uh, that's not going to give way. It's going to keep going up no matter who occupies the Oval Office <clears throat> next year. Um, I think, though, um, that there's a shift coming in the way that we think about problems overseas. And, and I hope that, as you say, our reach becomes a little more modest. Um, for example, I think that the <clears throat> extending stability through democracy has probably died a timely death, and certainly has in Iraq. You haven't heard anybody in the administration mention democracy and Iraq in the same sentence for a year or so, so that's, yeah, that's good. Um, but also, I think that there's, you know, I gave you the, the differential between the Pentagon budget and the State Department budget. The State Department budget can come up a long way and do some great stuff without anybody really noticing. I mean, it's what budget people call angel dust. You know, $150 million, that's nothing. So, you know, there's a lot of good stuff that can be done there. And I do expect the next administration, whatever party it is, to start doing that, some of that stuff. For example, there's a lot of talk about revitalizing or bringing back to life the U.S. Information Agency. We desperately need to do that. You know, it's part of what Colonel Petranzio is talking about for doing in Afghanistan. If you can put a U.S. information office in Kandahar or a Lashkar Gar, you know, one of those towns that's really where there's been a lot of heavy fighting and surround it with Marines so it doesn't get blown up, that'd be good. You know, that's part of that, you know, how to be lethal and non kinetic. So, you know, I think there's hope, but boy, you folks have to really push to get us there. The question is, uh, I spoke a lot about the Pentagon budgets that's going to this big dollar um, um, platforms, but are they also spending money on special forces, which uh, the questioner says are um, the most successful at actually finding uh, bad guys? And the answer is yes. They're spending a huge amount. Well, I shouldn't say a huge amount. Th the amount of money that they're spending on special forces has gone way up, and I don't have the figures in front of me, but. Um, um, they've been expanding the size of the special forces. There's a whole new ranger battalion, uh, so that now there's four. Um, the regular special forces have been, I forget what the figure is, but I think um, they're adding a battalion to every special forces group, so that's four more battalions. So there's a lot of new additional special forces folks out there in the world. Um, they're also spending a lot of money on secret stuff, which I don't know about, but it's like, you know, how to insert people, how to listen, what they call combat forensics. It's, you know, it's like police work. In fact, um, <laughs> two interesting things I should mention. One is that uh, a lot of units are going into Iraq taking with them police gang experts you know, from like the LAPD, because what they're doing is like gang work. You know, they're figuring out, you know, who's hanging with who and, you know, how do these networks operate? And the guys from the LAPD are really good at this. So, um, so that's not just special forces, but it's that kind of work that's going on. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was that there's a unit deploying to Afghanistan it's a National Guard unit from, I want to say, Missouri or Arkansas, and it's a unit of agriculture experts. What a great idea. They're National Guard folks, you know, who happen to be like county ag, whatever you call it, county, you know. Um, you know, they're, a they're soldiers, they're uniformed guys who are like agricultural experts. They're going to Afghanistan, a whole battalion of them. 
What a great idea. I couldn't believe it. This was great stuff. Anyway, thanks for your question. Yeah. All right, the two-part question. The first part was, <clears throat> what's up with the name, the war on terrorism, and do we really understand it, and, and, are, and are we hiding our failure behind this sort of grandiose name as we failed in the war on crime, I think you said. Uh, second question was, uh, how come we're spending so much more on defense than the rest of the world and we say we still don't have enough? Uh, let me take the second one first, as you know, they often say it depending on briefings. Um, you know, it's a question of what, what you think you need to do. And the past decisions have been we need to do a lot. We need to have a huge fleet of very expensive and very cool C-17 cargo planes because they hold a lot. And, you know, I've ridden around in these planes a lot, and they're magnificent. We need them. So we got them. They're expensive. Um, you know, tanker aircraft to refuel um, the medevac flights coming out of Iraq. Uh, you know, a huge amount of stuff. Now, if we decide that's not what we want to do, we want to do something different, that's good. But it'll take, you know, you can't change it easily. And, and again, you know, I refer back to this question of, you know, we're, I think Dave Wood thinks we're buying the wrong stuff, you know, okay. Um, I can make a good argument that we are buying stuff we don't need and aren't going to use, but it's an argument and it's going on in Washington. Um, I think if, you know, changing the defense budget is an enormously complicated and lengthy and wrenching process, which we are going to have to go through, I hope. Uh, the war on terrorism, right. Um, I found out this morning there are six studies going on within the Pentagon about what is the war on terrorism, what is counterinsurgency, and how do you fight it. But this is six years into it. You know, there's one study, Special Operations Command has a study going on. The Joint Staff's J-8 Directorate, which is like plans and assessments, they've got a study. And then PA&E, which is the um, Programs Analysis and Evaluation Directorate of the Pentagon Civilians, they've got a, two studies going on. I, I couldn't imagine what are they studying. But, you know, it goes to your point that we don't really quite understand what terrorism is, or even how to define it, and then what to do about it. So we're still grappling with that. But like I say, there's good folks doing the work. It just takes a while. Yes. The question is, how do I think that the three presidential candidates <clears throat> would approach the Middle East peace process? And uh, I have to say at the outset, I don't have a clue. But uh, let me guess. Um, I, I think it's pretty obvious that uh, that that period in which the U.S. sort of stepped back from the peace process, a lot of bad stuff happened, and we're paying the price. Um, so I, I can't imagine that any strategist would look at that situation and go, well, we can keep ignoring it, you know, because it's okay, because it's not okay. And a lot of what I was talking about, and especially people losing faith with their government and and starting to, to tie their loyalties to um, sectarian groups or ethnic groups, you know, that's what's happening. I mean, look at Hamas, which is a huge problem. Look at Hezbollah in, in, in Lebanon. Boy, you want to talk about something that got the Pentagon's attention. There was a little cluster of Hezbollah gunmen uh, hiding in some rubble, and along comes a, um, a platoon of Israeli tanks which was completely and utterly destroyed. Boy, did that get people's attention, because here's a bunch of guys, you know, who are untrained and using primitive weapons, and they destroyed what uh, many say are the best tanks on the face of the earth. Uh-oh. Um, so, like I say, a lot of bad stuff happened, and I think um, I, I can't imagine that there would be any justification left for ignoring that part of the world. But I could be wrong, you know. Question is, how long do I think we could continue to have 1% of the population protecting the other 99%? Um, I think indefinitely. I don't, you know, whether we should or not is a different question. Whether we can, um, I think 
most of the people that I know are pretty happy not having to go to war. And we have a lot of kids who are, you know, wanting to sign up. So, you know, I mean, the old phrase is, uh, you know, the military is at war and the country is at the mall, uh, you know, which is true. So that's not good, I think, but I don't see any great clamor to change it. Uh, I spent some time um, in a little town in Ohio a year or two ago where th this was a pretty small town. There had been two kids killed in Iraq from this town. And I went there to find out how everybody was feeling. And I was astonished because people were going, oh, yeah, I think I heard about those kids. And hmm, that's too bad, but it's got nothing to do with me. And, you know, there was like a complete brain separation of people you know, who felt no responsibility to take part in the war or to, to be even be sort of paying attention. And what was interesting was um, almost everybody I talked to said, well, I don't have any connection to these kids, you know, whatever. It's too bad, you know, but I'm not going to join up. And But when they brought the, the body home of one of these kids, they flew him into, I think, Columbus Airport. And this town is like 60 miles north of Columbus, up the interstate. So they bring them home, bring the body home, the casket arrives, they put it in a hearse, they start driving up towards this town. And, um, tr and I guess it had been on the radio, on the news, that this kid's body was coming home, being killed in Iraq. And semi-tractor trailer rigs started con converging on this hearse and, and, and formed a phalanx, like an honor guard all the way up the interstate, like dozens of trucks. Wow, it was, it was amazing. So, you know, there is a real, uh, I don't know how to describe it. It's a very strange situation where a lot of people don't feel any responsibility whatsoever, and other people are just this huge outpouring of support and, and, and what's the word I want? Sympathy, not sympathy, but um, solidarity, you know, with the troops and with their families, and that's good. That's an interesting question. The question was, what can they do? This is a real interesting thing. I, I wrote a story a couple of weeks ago about um, the Maryland National Guard has a uh, has uh, what 1,200, 1,400 guys in Iraq, and they're coming and women. They're coming back in March, and the the National Guard, the Maryland National Guard, has dreamed up this whole set of programs to help these folks reintegrate back into society. And, and one of the things that they want to do is to bring them, you know, they come home, they go on vacation, then they go back to their jobs and families. And one of the things the Guard wants to do is to bring them back 30 days later and 60 days later to say, okay, what kind of problems are you having? So to do another health assessment, to say, you know, we've got people who can help you with your taxes, with, you know, if you need family counseling, we have volunteers, all these kind of programs. Here's the problem. They can't get any money for this stuff. You know, there's no state money, hardly any, and there's no federal money. The Pentagon won't pay for this stuff. And, you know, there's other stupid problems like if you're the National Guard and you want to bring these combat veterans back after 90 days, well, guess what? They're all scattered all over the state and they're a job. So, you know, they don't have to use their own money to come to wherever to, co to go to one of these weekends. And the National Guard wants to bring them back, put them in a nice hotel, and, you know, tell them to bring their kids. We'll provide child care and all that kind of stuff. They can't do it because there's no money. Well, so I wrote this story, and I got flooded with people saying, this is an outrage. You know, how can I help? Well, there is no good way to help. You can't write a check to the National Guard. <laughs> Because they can't accept it. They're a government. You can't write it. You can't give money to the government. <laughs> Odd as that may seem. <laughs> they can take it, but you can't give it. <laughs> yeah, it's a very bizarre situation. So, um, you know, there's no good way to help. It's one of the real strange and bad things about this war is that people do want to help and there's no good way to do it. Yeah, the question actually was more of a comment, and sir, I'm glad to have you uh, participating. Um, the comment was uh, that uh, 35 years ago, did you say 35, 45? Some time ago, we thought up this concept of the hospital ship Hope, and that 
Um, I am sure you're all familiar with the hope. It goes around to various third world ports, pulls in, and they do um, uh, um, me medical, humanitarian, thank you, humanitarian missions and medical stuff and fix up kids who have hair lips and amputated legs and so forth. And, and uh, the gentleman said, if we had been doing that more widely in the world, we'd be in a lot better position. I think that's what you had to say. You know, good thought, great thought. In fact, there's talk now of uh, having the Navy ramp up 12 more ships like that and sending them out into the world. I, I'm not sure where that idea came from, but it's been rocketing around Washington the last couple of days. So maybe something happening on that score. And if there's not, you ought to make it happen. Yes. I'm sorry? Good. Okay. That was my colleague, uh, Robert Little, who wrote that. Yeah. It's an imperfect program. It could be done well, though, I think. Uh, the comment is um, that this uh, gentleman is not impressed with uh, the Pentagon, Donald Rumsfeld, or even the uh, colonel I talked about trying to figure out what to do in Iraq, and, um, and that we need to have a more humble uh, approach to the rest of the world. Uh, you remember George Bush used that very word in a debate in 2000 in the presidential campaign. He said, we need to have a more humble foreign policy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, it's one of the things that bothers me about, that bothered me a little bit. It's one of the things that bothered me a little bit about what this, uh, you know, the, the military's approach, which sort of assumes, hey, we have a place in your country. Well, you know, maybe not. And I, th my own personal feeling is that we need to be a lot more humble about saying things like, how can we help? You know, we don't, we're not good at that. And we, you know, we tend to come in and say, you need X and I'm gonna give it to you, you know? Well, you know, clearly that's not working too well. So I take your point and, and I wish that we would indeed adopt a more humble attitude toward the rest of the world, amen. Thanks so much for an interesting evening. Can I just say one more thing before you all go? One more thing before you go. I have started a blog, and if any of you are interested in, you know, what interests me, I throw all kinds of things up on that blog. Go to the Baltimore Sun website and scroll down in the blog section to something called Military Watch. Um, I'm just experimenting with it. Feel free to, you know, look at it. Send me, uh, you know, comments or angry denunciations or whatever. But. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, just want to mention. Thank you.